the important part of these things, I think, in terms of lasting impact is, you know, it's set up to have a lot of energy fed into the white guy at the front of the room. But the real deal is the community, uh, not in some airy sense, but in the sense that someone in this room has what you need or knows how to get it. And uh, since we look like everybody else in society, more or less, I view these events as uh, coming out parties of a sort. And uh, you know, if you if you actually connect with the people around you, it probably sets you up for a a, a long term involvement with these things. Hopefully, it doesn't set you up for anything else. Uh, you do have to use your native intelligence. Uh, more and more over the years, the motivation for these things has been simply to. Uh, bring people together who have an interest in consciousness alteration and talk about uh, the implications, the methods, the materials, and uh, the ethnographic and social context of it. And the group sort of sets the agenda. I mean, some groups... It's recipe exchange time, and it's very much down on the practical, nitty-gritty level. New plants, new techniques. Uh, and that's very useful. Other groups, it's implications. I mean, what does this mean? It is a, it is a very curious category of human experience. Uh, the only thing I can compare it to is human sexuality, but the differences are vast because human sexuality is pretty much scripted into the biology of each one of us. In other words, it's unlikely that you're going to get to the grave without having some kind of confrontation uh, or exploration of your sexuality. It is entirely possible to go to the grave without ever coming near to psychedelics or even having heard about it. Yet... Once you encounter it, you see that this is uh, an aspect or an activity as informing of what it means to be human as, as something uh, as inimical to our nature as sexuality. So it's sort of the, um, the secret uh, agenda of the brain-mind system or the secret agenda of the human organism. Why, perturbed by the tertiary constituents of some few species of plants, does the human mind break forth with Niagara's of alien beauty? It doesn't make evolutionary sense. Uh, it seems, as Aldous Huxley said of it, a gratuitous grace. What he meant by that was it's neither necessary nor sufficient for salvation, but it's a, a wonderful kick in the pants anyway. It's like a freebie from nature. And um, culture, at least the culture that we're living in, has over centuries, uh, in fact a couple millennia, become tremendously phobic about this aspect of what it is to be human. They're also, it bears pointing out, fairly phobic about sexuality too. It's just that they've never figured out a way to regulate it the way they can regulate this. If they could make it illegal, they would, you know. Instead, you know, the, such things as uh, having people close their eyes when they undress so they're not subject to temptation. I mean... This went on in the cult that I escaped from, uh, which was the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> and this has been going on for a long, long time, this perturbation of consciousness with plants and the exploration of these magical dimensions. Nevertheless, it seems to me, anyway, that it has uh, a potential role in the planetary crisis that somehow 
the nature of the crisis is in in some sense psychological in other words we have the technology to save ourselves we have the financial base we have the tools of mass communication and uh, propaganda and so forth but what we lack is the will to change our minds you know we're trying to deal with a global situation on the brink of self-immolation and we're doing it with the brains of stone age hunters and it's astonishing that we've gotten as far as we have i mean you know if you think that uh, human beings are uh, sort of the little brothers of the angels then it's a pretty uh, screwed up situation but the fact of the matter is that human beings are some kind of advanced form of primate and when you think about that and that we hurl instruments outside the solar system we can if uh, so inclined call down the processes that light the stars in heaven down upon the cities of our enemies monkeys you know first cousin to the groundhog and the chipmunk doing things like this is uh, an extraordinary situation mind you know our whole culture is uh, lived out in the light of the myth that everything is understood and that everything is as it appears that the surface is everything in order to maintain that fiction an extraordinary intellectual sight of hand has to be performed because what has to be denied is the magical nature of the perceiver and that's one self uh if this planet were simply the habitat of sperm whales humming birds and termites then darwinian evolutionary mechanics as modified by molecular genetics would be sim- uh, would be sufficient to explain what's going on on this planet but the extraordinary uh manifestation of cognitive ability in one species has created a situation that is entirely outside the domain of evolutionary theory we are the anomalous factor in the natural world something happened to us uh a couple of million years ago not that long ago and an animal species an advanced animal species of which there have been many in the history of the earth began to uh, fall under the influence of a kind of attractor a kind of um well in the same way that iron filings will arrange themselves into a complex pattern when a magnet is brought near them like under the surface of a piece of paper that they're resting on the human species began to organize itself at the behest of a kind of invisible field that was penetrating into this species and what came out of this is what's called epigenetic process epigenetic means processes not under the control of genes now in nature you have epigenetic processes at the inorganic level we would call the dynamics of the sun epigenetic or the dynamics of uh continental drift or or desert building or volcanism these are epigenetic processes but we established an epigenetic foothold at the other end of the spectrum in the domain of conceptuality and for 100,000 years at least the human form has not been physically modified in any dramatic fashion they have human skeletons from the Colossus River cave mouth site in South Africa 100,000 years old people indistinguishable from uh modern humans and yet in that 100,000 years we have reinvented ourselves 
over and over and over again. First as goddess-worshipping nomads practicing an orgiastic religion and following our flocks across the plains of Africa. Then as uh, city builders in the Middle East dominated by kingship and obsessed with agriculture and monotheism. Then as uh, pantheistic uh, philosophs with a penchant for uh, uh, metaphysical speculation, the whole Hellenistic world, then a new phase of imperialism, so forth and so on. And this is simply, I'm, I'm just following the Western thread of development. So the elaboration of languages, cultural forms, styles of ornament, uh, all of these things represent something entirely new on the face of nature. And imagine, I mean, the planet has existed for four and a half billion years. And, you know, all kinds of uh, evolutionary surges have taken place. The, the, the age of the Crossopterygian fishes, the age of amphibians, the Carboniferous forests of the Pennsylvanian, the era of the sauropods, the age of mammals, so forth and so on. All of these things have come and gone without intelligence being called out of nature. But for some reason, it happened to us. I'm not going to discuss it this evening. If somebody wants to ask a question about it tomorrow, I can sketch for you uh, why I think psychedelics had a role in human emergence. But that's not my point this evening. My point this evening is simply uh, the fact of the matter. The fact that consciousness is inexplicable and it is the confounding of the very reductionist theories that it itself has generated. Science, um, beginning from the time of the Greeks, the method was basically to attack the simplest problems first. So, you know, questions like, what is matter? This we, we made great strides with. Questions like, what is language? were not even seriously asked until the 19th century and only began to be answered in the 20th century. The uh, mind as an object of psychology, uh, is, is uh, a study really less than a hundred years old, or approximately a hundred years old. So uh, reductionism solved the simple problems first. Science uh, is, an, is no better at providing final answers than is uh, astrology or voodoo, or any other self-consistent intellectual system. And uh, where we've gotten into trouble is that science, based on its bobble production capacity, has claimed a kind of uh, preeminence among intellectual systems uh, so that all... Uh, models of the universe are supposedly to be submitted to science for it to pass judgment upon. Th this is uh, really a mistake. It's a naive understanding of what the intellectual enterprise is. The best you can ask of a theory is that it be self-consistent on its own terms. So... Astrology is self-consistent on its own terms. Homeopathy is self-consistent on its own terms. Um, science, mathematics. But no one of these systems can claim preeminence to judge the others. I mention this because I think part of what being psychedelic is about, the real shock of psychedelics comes from the realization of the relativity of cultural positions, that nothing is really secure. Every society that has ever lived or flourished 
on this planet has assumed that it had a model of reality that was 95% correct and that the missing 5% would be provided in the next 20 years. And every society that held that assumption was wrong. We now, from our exalted position on the uh, pyramid of epistemic enterprise, can make that judgment. But what we don't get is that must mean then that we too are whistling past the graveyard (laughs) and that these fine models uh, that we entertain will, uh, from the vantage point of some future world, appear as quaint, as contrived, and as cramped as the medieval cosmology or the Sumerian uh, mythology appears to us today. Well, so then the deal is that life is some kind of an opportunity to basically indulge yourself in the exploration of circumstance, what Wittgenstein called the present at hand. And everyone is born into a preconceived modality of what the present at hand is. You inherit this from your culture. You know, you're educated into it. And it's possible to never question that and then to uh, um, operate within the values of that system. So if it makes a premium of being a, a good warrior, you learn to kill cleanly. If it makes uh, uh, an idol of being able to amass vast amounts of money, then you do that and then you gain the uh, the respect of the culture. But at a certain point, for people above a certain level of intelligence, which is not that high, I might add, uh, the question arises uh, as to you know, just how real and enduring these cultural values are. And at that point, you're set up to uh, melt down the culturally inherited mind and attempt to recast it into something with which you can be more comfortable. And this is where the psychedelics come in. Uh, Over the course of the weekend, we'll talk about them in different ways. But at the beginning, I like to talk about them in the simplest way possible and say, you know, I had a professor, actually some of you may have read his books, Paul Feyerabend, and he used to say to us in, in Epistemology 101, uh, I'll teach you to recognize the truth and I'll teach you what's so great about it. And the second question is much more interesting than the first. Well, psychedelics uh, are, are like that. Looked at generically, where we're not concerned with the... Um, particularized exotic of your trip or my trip, but looked at on the scale of a thousand or ten thousand trips, what what is generally true is that these things dissolve boundaries. And if you, this turns out to be tremendously important because the only other points in life where boundaries are dissolved is at the brink of the yawning grave and at orgasm and at the edge of sleep. And uh, dissolution of boundary is somehow the precondition for understanding reality. It's a paradox, and we will meet many paradoxes because the effort to create intellectual closure in any system is again... Uh, a product of intellectual infantilism. The truth about reality is that nowhere is it writ large that monkeys should be able to elicit a final understanding of it. I mean, if you met a termite whose goal was to understand reality, you would think this was a charming naivete. Well, but I've got news for you. The difference between you and a termite cast against that enterprise is precisely zilch. So uh, uh, what 
sophisticated people, whatever that means, learn to do is live with unanswered questions. Live without closure. It's not unusual in a physics experiment to, from theory, be able to produce, predict an experimental result to three decimal points of accuracy. Uh, so all of the sciences aspired to this level of mathematical precision and formality. Meanwhile, so, uh, physics, moving ahead of the pack, moved into the domain of the microphysical, and all that precision fell to pieces. And it was revealed that at that level, particles are both wave and concrest object. Time runs backward. Causality is slewed. Particles pe virtually penetrate energy thresholds that they can't get over. I mean, it is uh, a funhouse of paradoxical effects. And uh, I think that I, I, saw a dis or I saw a videotape of a discussion that illuminated all this. Some of you may have seen this book that was published last year called uh, Consciousness Explained by Dennett. It should have been called Consciousness Explained Away. Uh, it, was, it was really a stupid book. I picked it up, and this is my test for books on the origin of consciousness. You just flip to the index to drugs, and if there's no entry, you don't give up yet. You look at psychedelic, and if there's no entry, save your, save your money, folks, <laughs> because no theory of consciousness is going to be uh, worth anything that doesn't come to terms with the perturbation of consciousness uh, by drugs. Anyway, I saw Dennett in conversation with a physicist on Dutch TV, and Dennett was saying, I just want to eliminate the idea that the brain is magical material. And the physicist turned to him and said, but don't you realize, my dear fellow, we physicists have now established that matter <laughs> is magical material. And so that's where that discussion was left. As this realization of, parad of the paradoxicality implicit in all phenomenon rolls back into the sciences, the life sciences I'm talking about now, I think the psychedelics will be uh, become much more interesting and the data that they produce will become much more uh, uh, assimilable. The thing that got me into this in the beginning, I mean, other than that I was a hedonist and I like to get loaded and this and that, but the philosophical thing was this question of, uh, it began basically as just the simple question of the source of the visions. Because... Uh, trying to think with a certain degree of intellectual cleanness, you can see that there is no reason why every single one of us should have locked in our brain a Niagara of visual beauty. What is it doing there? Evolution teaches us that organismic uh, architectures must be efficient that a species that wastes energy on the retention of an organ or a chemical system or a uh, s behavior that does not promote uh, survival is an organism on the way to being eliminated from life's competitive uh, game. Well, why then? Uh, you know, a, a billion and a half years after life started, do we each have this innate capacity to produce more art, more beauty in an hour and a half episode of hallucination than the entire species has produced in 15,000 years of artistic endeavor doesn't make any sense in evolutionary terms unless, unless it's not in the organism, this data unless the argument that evolutionary mechanics are impinging on this data is a false argument. Uh, this relates to, and this is sort of a subset of the neurophysiological problems that reflect on psychedelics, but uh, the problem of memory. Memory 
is a real problem for reductionist physiologists because it's well understood that in the course of a 70-year lifetime, you will swap out every atom in your body except neural DNA uh, seven or eight times. And yet there are 80-year-old people who with no difficulty at all can remember the smell of their grandmother's dress when as a three-year-old she used to take them into her lap. How is this possible? Where is the memory trace that it can survive all of this uh, um, cycling of material? Uh, A physicalist, would want to claim that it must be in the neural DNA. But geneticists have such a limited definition of the kinds of information that can be stored in DNA that they totally heap scorn on the idea that you could, for example, store a phone number or an odor or a line of poetry in DNA. They say you, you've missed the concept. You don't realize what the, the information in DNA is protein sequence information, nothing else. If true, then that hands back to everybody the problem of memory. Is it possible then that memory is somehow stored outside the body? Of course, this sounds radical, but you have to remember to the 19th century, uh, um, action at a distance was thought to be magic the notion that a hundred years into the future the world would be bathed in an ocean of UHF, VHF, uh, radio, TV, uh, and other forms of electromagnetic information uh, carrying data everywhere would have been totally a cult to the 19th century. They would not have been able to conceive of that. Uh, Our paradigm... Our scientific paradigm is obviously in need of serious revision. And where the exhibits can be elucidated that make this point most strongly is in psychological and mental phenomena. And in, within that domain, it's the perturbation of the brain-mind system by psychedelics that is most dramatic. Uh, another point on this breakdown of physics thing, to preserve its enterprise uh, even in a diminished form, what the physicists have had to do is make a place in their theorizing for the observer. The observer becomes very important to these uh, quantum mechanical processes. And in fact, outcomes are affected by the interaction with the observer. The reason uh, psychologists have been so uh, standoffish with psychedelics is because they were operating under an earlier scientific paradigm where the observer was thought to be a kind of godlike point of view outside the system. Now the news comes from physics that there is no such thing as outside the system, that that's a, a, an intellectual fiction, again, based on naivete. This seems to me to open the door for legitimate taking of psychedelics by the researchers who are then going to describe their effects on other people or their pharmacokinetics or any other parameter of these substances. And finally... I think that uh, the model of psychedelics that I've come to rest with after operating with the others, and I'll briefly enumerate them, uh, this isn't an exhaustive list, but the approaches to psychedelics, one of the earliest ones was uh, the madness model or the psychotomimetic model. This said, aha, Madness must be chemically based. These chemicals are pseudo and near neurotransmitters. They must mimic madness. The obvious conclusion from believing that is that you would then go and look at the cerebrospinal fluid of of insane people and you should find psychedelic molecules 
this has turned out to be incredibly frustrating and in fact it's basically been abandoned a DMT for example which you would I, if you were naive you would just assume I think that that human madness might be related to DMT and DMT does occur in human metabolism but not at elevated levels in schizophrenics and not uh, in any way correlated to any other uh, pathology. Uh, so that was one model, the madness model. Then a more friendly model was uh, the uh, sort of the Freudian slash Jungian model, that there is a portion of our mental life called the unconscious, which is hidden from the ordinary inspection of the conscious mind, and that on psychedelics you access portions of this. In the Freudian variety, it's all about um, <coughs> repressed sexual stuff and wish fulfillment and what he called day residues, meaning uh, jumbled memories of recent experience. Uh, I think the Jung, except in the case of LSD, which is a rather Freudian drug, actually. In other words, you do recover memories of childhood episodes of abuse, and, and uh, you do realize that you've been treating people badly and so forth. It seems addressed to the psychodynamics of the self. The Jungian model... Uh, is a broader model because it says, uh, again, countervailing these geneticists who say DNA only contains protein sequencing information, the Jungians want to say that there is uh, a race memory, a collective unconscious, that you can go deep into the self and reach beyond personal memory and personal trauma to racial memory and racial trauma and ultimately by a process of following these epi these genetic trees all life all of the Gaian uh, biosphere becomes available so that's another model um, a, a model that is closer to my presupposition but not sufficiently um, formal I guess would be the word, is shamanism. Shamanism, as probably most of you know, is the worldwide paleolithic religion of ecstasis and magical curing that is how religion was practiced for the first million years before weasels got hold of it uh, and substituted dogma for experience. I mean, that's the real difference uh, between shamanism and other religious enterprises is there is no such thing as shamanic theology. Shamanism is experience. And I, for a long time, found that the most satisfying model. It's a, Even though shamanism is archaic, in a sense, that's a, a, almost a science fiction model because what the shamanic model is saying is that uh, there is a parallel universe or universes of some sort and that you can, by ascending some kind of cosmic axis, it differs from culture to culture, it's like an elevator in reality and you discover there are these different planes you can visit and... Uh, acquire power and cut deals and become a curer and transcend cultural limitation. The model that I've come to favor that is more radical, I guess, in its implications because it uh, takes the phenomenon more seriously is the model that is largely mathematical. In other words, saying that uh, the proper way to talk about the psychedelic experience is in the vocabulary of non-Euclidean and hyper, higher plane geometry. The notion being something like this, that the mind 
is a multidimensional manifold of some sort, but it takes the shape of its vessel in the same way that a liquid takes the shape of its vessel. And because we are animals of meat and sinew, uh, the circumstance into which mind must pour itself is a situation of evolutionary competition and constant threat. And so in our species, mind has developed into a kind of all-purpose threat detection device. The correlation of intelligence to paranoia ought to prove this. So what mind does for us is it's constantly calculating the odds of danger and physical attack and strategy of response and so forth and so on. But that is not the essence of mind. That is the response of mind to being contained or constrained by this lower dimensional space. And when you take a psychedelic in silent darkness where there's no extraneous uh, parameters forcing themselves in upon you, the mind unfolds itself. Or another way to think of it would be, you know, there are certain compounds in organic and inorganic chemistry that have more than one crystal formation. At a certain temperature, they crystallize and have a certain crystalline geometry. But if you keep raising the temperature, sulfur will do this, for example. It reliquifies. Then at a yet higher temperature, it recrystallizes again. This is how I think of mind, that put through the crucible of the psychedelic experience, and I use this kind of alchemical terminology deliberately, put through the crucible of the psychedelic experience, the mind becomes fluid and then is recast in a higher dimensional manifold. This is why, you see, what's always claimed of shamanism by shamans is that they violate ordinary causality. And what that means is they can see who stole the chicken or who... uh, ran away with the game or who's philandering who these now anthropologists dismiss this and say all these people are naive about causality and ordinary epistemic categories and so forth and so on but that's not what's happening they actually do do these things anybody who spends time with shaman will become aware not of spectacular magic not of you know Carlos Castaneda style dances in the waterfalls and appearing 500 miles away from where you started 10 minutes later, but a very subtle kind of magic, all of which can be reduced to that these people have a slight hyperspatiality to their relationship to time. In the ordinary experience is a point-like experience of the now, These shamans seem to diffuse their consciousness and and are actually running slightly ahead of everybody else. This is why shamans are always associated with weather prediction, you know, because you only have to have a leg up 24 hours to produce spectacular weather prediction. This is why shamans know where the game went, because they see where the game went. And... It doesn't seem that far-fetched when you think about the fact that from one point of view, all uh, biology is about the conquest of dimensionality. This is a, a statement that is consistent from ourselves sitting here this evening down to the first protobiotic slimes on clay banks in, in the, you know, archaeozoic. Uh, life conquers dimensions. The, it, the earliest forms of life were fixed in space. They were point-like. They had no organs of sense at all. <coughs> then what came was motility, 
and but still no no extended perceptors uh, life literally felt its way uh, then light sensitive pigmentation sequestered itself on the se- on the surfaces of primitive organisms and they established a, a light gradient a sense of here and there notice that to have a sense of here and there you have to have a sense of time which is another dimension you are claiming that dimension and integrating it into your description of the world higher order animals simply build on that conquest of spatiality until you get to advanced, highly advanced primates. And then you get language. And language is clearly a strategy for escaping from the point-like nature of the present. Because with language, you can command the past and you can strategically anticipate the future. So your existence is extended in a, in a geometric sense. Now, I think this, this, in the same way that you all know the cliché, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, <coughs> in that spirit then, culture is now recapitulating the individual journey toward hyperdimensionality. And uh, culture is about to go hyperdimensional. That's what is creating the crisis at the end of history. The reason history is ending is because it's a linear enterprise and it's about to be phased out. Psychedelics make all of this uh, operationally potentized, usable. In other words, it isn't just simply a wrap of some sort. It's a road map. It's a way of relating to reality. And uh, as the weekend goes forward, um, we'll explore the implications of this for ourselves personally as a tool for personal growth and as uh, a cultural metaphor, which is sort of what I have tried to bring to the psychedelic thing that other people haven't. Ultimately, I see it as a culture-transforming engine. Uh, But, of course, the elements of culture are individuals. And to the degree that individuals psychedelicize themselves, they force this process forward into completion. And I feel that there's a certain urgency about this, or there may be a certain urgency about it. It, In any any case, it uh, has a moral imperative, which may sound strange since it's illegal and invade against and excoriated as vice and degradation. But nevertheless, if consciousness doesn't loom large in the human future, then it is not a human future. You know, nature is looking with hard eyes at this little experiment launched with the melting of the glaciers. We consider the dinosaurs a failure. For a hundred million years, they were uh, the masters of the planet. We've pulled our act together in the last million years, and we're already staring extinction in the face. And yet, the enterprise of intelligence is without precedent in the organic world. I mean, where are you going to get Milton? Where are you going to get uh, Einstein? Where are you going to get Bach and Duccio and all the rest of the gang out of a world of hummingbirds, chipmunks, and glaciers? So I don't think we should sell ourselves uh, short. We are not epiphenomenal. We are the trigger species on this planet. Uh, We are now basically directing and impacting on the entire biome of the planet. The implications of this have yet to be worked out. We don't know whether we're witnessing a rush toward extinction or whether we are um, setting ourselves up for a leap into a higher order of reality. Psychedelics, I think, exist not only to birth this process, but to also assuage the anxiety that is connected with it. Because 
it is a phase transition of major magnitude. I don't think it's the yawning grave, but I also don't think you're going to take your Ferrari with you. It's uh, going to be tight indeed getting through this narrow neck. And what lies beyond it is as incomprehensible to us as a future life as a collector of mogul miniatures and stock brokering would be to a fetus trapped in the birth canal. You know, when you're trapped in the birth canal, it just looks like suffocation, strangulation, termination, death. You cannot conceive that it is a necessary uh, initiation to a higher order of existence. Yes. Um, regarding, the, you said last night that, you, that today, Petchoff, basically if somebody, he raised the question, which I am, but on the uh, mushroom's role in the uh, communication process, the, the, basically the food of that theory. You said if oh. you want to ask the question today, you would know, Okay. Yes, well, the, the book that I did for Bantam called Food of the Gods, I sort of thought of as a Trojan horse for anthropology because I had a conscious political agenda, which was I wanted to insinuate the notion of uh, psychedelics as necessary to human evolution. I wanted to insinuate that idea into orthodox anthropology and, and uh, primate evolutionary theory. So I wrote a book addressed to the larger world, in, in other words, in an academic style with footnotes and so forth and so on, arguing that the way to account for our peculiar predicament in nature in other words, that we are obviously some kind of animal, but yet carrying this enormous proclivity for uh, code generation and manipulation of material. I mean, we are literally the idea excreting animal. We don't make honeycombs and coral reefs. We make transistors and automobiles and skyscrapers and aircraft and all of this stuff. Uh, that our predicament in nature can only be explained by some extraordinary confluence of unusual forces. And orthodox evolutionary theory, when it comes to human emergence, basically fails. Nobody has a clue because it happens so quickly. The human brain doubled in size in a million and a half years. The anthropologist, evolutionary biologist Lumholtz calls this the most dramatic modification of a major organ of a higher animal in the entire fossil record. And it cannot be explained by evolutionary theory, as mod uh, Darwinian theory as modified by molecular genetics, to the great embarrassment of these concerns, because it is, after all, the organ which generated this theory. <laughs> A point not to be lost sight of, you see. <clears throat> so my notion was that there must have been an extraordinary catalytic interaction of some sort that had to be driven by a f some kind of factor in the environment. And bipedalism, binocular vision, incipient language, complex pack signaling, all of this comes together at a moment of um, dietary crisis in our remote ancestors. Because as we left the arboreal canopy of the climaxed rainforests, which were under climatological retreat at that time, that's why we were leaving, uh, we had to switch our diet from being fruititarian and insectivorous. Uh, there was suddenly, that was all very uh, difficult to obtain. And the bit in nature is that animals tend to specialize foods as a strategy for avoiding mutagenic influence in the environment. In other words, if you only eat one thing and you have enzyme systems designed to guard you against any toxin present in that food, then you can hold the level of, of uh, chemically induced mutation to a low level. If you're an omnivore, you're at high risk for 
toxicologically induced mutational stress. And when we went into this food experimental phase, one of the foods that we surely would have encountered was uh, psilocybin mushrooms because ungulate animals, proto-cattle, were evolving in this same African grassland environment. Uh, Psilocybin to my mind, is uniquely positioned environmentally and pharmacologically to be the trigger enzyme for this induction of consciousness into this advanced hominid. The reasons are that, uh, well, the first reason is purely physiological, that low doses of psilocybin increase visual acuity. And this would have tremendous impact on an animal that was surviving through predation. On low doses of psilocybin, your sensitivity to edge detection, which means movement of an animal in a grassland environment at a distance, is up to 20% more sensitive than in an unstoned human being. The guy who discovered this, Roland Fisher, said to me when I discussed it with him, he said, so you see, here is a case where taking a drug definitely gives you a more accurate picture of reality than if you had avoided the drug. It's just a perfect proof of it. Well, at higher doses, psilocybin induces uh, group sexual activity, orgy, because it causes arousal. If any of you are primatologists, you probably know that our we are very closely related to chimpanzees and that then there is a second set of chimpanzees, uh, a species or subspecies, there's argument about it, called bonubos. And the sexual style of these two brands of chimpanzees could hardly be more different. The ordinary chimpanzee, it's all about male dominance, female control, suppression of homosexuality, just, to, you know, the bit... And the bonubos are like polymorphically sexual and pansexual and just, you know, complete ongoing party all the time. (laughs) And the genetic difference between these two species is very, very slight, but the behavioral difference is tremendous. And more and more, as you approach the realm of consciousness, behavior becomes... uh, what is being modified rather than the physical expression. Um, The third... Huh? You know, that behaviors are modified, but organs and general present physical presentation isn't. And the third level of catalytic action by psilocybin in terms of evolution is that uh, it triggers cognition, whatever that means. It also triggers... Glossolalia, spontaneous displays of language-like activity. And I imagine that the secret to understanding the emergence of language is to realize that language was fully developed before meaning was attached to it. That it's an aesthetic, it's an abstract expressionist activity for most of the history of its use. And only in the past 50,000 years or so has it been enslaved to the concept of symbolic activity. The mystery of our position in nature has to do with the fact that um, like, that the, well, let me put it this way, all primates, clear back to squirrel monkeys and lemurs, have dominance hierarchies male dominance hierarchies. What this means is that the young, hard-bodied, long-fanged males control everybody, the elderly, the females, the young, homosexuals, everybody is under the control. And what happened to us as a species uh, by design or accident is another issue which we can discuss. But what happened to us is that for perhaps as long as a million years by including psilocybin in the diet, we inhibited this tendency to form these dominance hierarchies. That's what the group sex was all about. It represents a boundary dissolution. You see, in, a, in an orgiastic society, 
lines of male paternity cannot be traced. Consequently, men do not own children in those kinds of societies. The loyalty of men goes to the group, the children of the group. And it forms a much more cohesive uh, social mind, if you will. We functioned like this for perhaps 150,000 years in the light of consciousness. What was happening on the African plain was a slow migration of behaviors and and, uh, habits toward the domestication of cattle. Uh, It began, you see, with our truly primitive hominid ancestors probably just following along behind these large herds of ungulate animals living on lion kills and stuff like that. But by what following along behind cattle means is a familiarity with manure and what that means is mushrooms in a tropical grassland environment. And over the millennia, the cattle the mushrooms, and the human beings were drawn into a tighter and tighter symbiosis so that at the melting of the last glaciers 22,000 years ago, from then until about 10,000 BC, what you actually had was a kind of partnership paradise and the actual moment of human archaic fulfillment when men and women and human beings, and the environment, and everything was in balance for perhaps 10,000 years. Uh, And and in that period, and it was not dramatic, I don't mean to imply that, it was a process stretched out over the last 100,000 years. In that period, the things that make us most human and most different from animal existence were put in place, things like music, art, altruism, theater, dance, poetry, um, play, technology, all of these things came into being. Well, then, when the mushroom religion faded and human populations uh, blossomed out over the planet and the Sahara turned dry and the cradle was emptied, uh, these, these pharmacologically suppressed patterns of male dominance reasserted themselves. I mean, there was literally a reversion to a set of behaviors that had been chemically suppressed for a very, very long time. And you get then control of women by men, classism, xenophobia, mm, warfare, the whole set of screwball institutions that have pushed us to the brink of Armageddon come into play right then when we grew beyond the bounds of this symbiotic relation uh, with psilocybin. So that was the end. The chimpanzee strain that you discussed is still happening. Is that current? Is that a, that strain? I forget what done it. Whatever you call it, is that still Bonubo. current? Bonubo. Where psilocybin still grows and they still live on No, it? no. The, none of these primates are grassland creatures. This was a unique human thing, probably because uh, what happened was the forest environments in which we were at climax w- w- turned into islands. And the only environment available, they were islanded by grassland, the only environment available. And as the resource base in the canopy shrank, there was real pressure to explore this new uh, environment. Grasslands are very recent. I mean, uh, all the species of the grasslands can be found in the forest understory. And the forest itself is, you know, has many, many orders of magnitude more species than the grasslands, yeah. There's a lot of people that say that the change happened when extraterrestrials came down and influenced the primates. Do you have any feeling? Well, I, there was a little genuflection to that in my rap when I said whether by chance or design our remote ancestors contacted the mushroom. If you want to... The extraterrestrials are, in a sense, an unnecessary hypothesis because uh, it could have been perfectly chance that we encountered these mushrooms in the environment. The fact that they are so extraterrestrial 
in presentation. Actually, I was thinking about this two nights ago in the middle of the night, and Alan Bediner and I got quite excited because I saw more clearly than I'd ever seen before how this extraterrestrial pharmacology deal might work. Um, And it's something like this. Imagine that you are an extraterrestrial with an incredibly advanced technical understanding of, of life, matter, so forth and so on, so that you can essentially produce anything at the technological level. And for some reason...